I'm Marty Sakata. This is the Ivy Family Office Network. Uh, so we started this group uh, more than 20 years ago. I was working in Switzerland, uh, and there was a huge uh, financial crisis with long-term capital management. And anybody who remembers that uh, occurrence was uh, Deutsche Bank, uh, sorry, Bankers Trust, and UBS were at the center of it. They were, they were both lending to long-term capital management and lending to the Russians. And there were the big prices on, on Russian bonds, right? So uh, there was forced merger between uh, Deutsche Bank and, and Bankers Trust and between uh, Swiss Bank and UBS. Swiss Bank took over UBS, kept the name UBS. And I was part of a group that came back to reorganize everything. Uh, so I started a group of Wharton guys investing directly in private equity eons ago. And uh, more than this family office group, since then we've had more than 50,000 uh, people attend our events, uh, 7,000 family offices that have also attended with about 5,000 speakers. And we've probably engaged 35,000 people, you know, who have talked about speaking at our events. And, you know, so, so we uh, uh, moved to, because of COVID, we moved to this hybrid model. We started doing a lot of events in Texas and Florida that were live and uh, on Zoom. We continue to do that. And depending on what city we're in, the audience fluctuates in size. So in Florida, we'll grab, we'll have 200 plus people in attendance live and about 250 online. And then the same in New York, we'll have around 100, 150 people live. And then we'll have around um, 200, 300 people online. So we uh, create around 15 hours of video a month that we put out to our YouTube website. It's got about 600,000 views right now with about 450 videos, but we expect to get to a million in the next six months, hopefully, uh, views. So we're averaging around 1,000 to 2,000 views per video. Great uh, exposure that way. So uh, just to give you some more background on the group. Uh, so when we first started, you know, everything was hedge funds, probably about 80, 90% of our product was hedge funds, hedge funds, hedge funds. A 2008 happened. A lot of the hedge funds were lever beta instead of alpha. And so we kind of transitioned. We looked a lot, uh, uh, 2009 to 2010 were like the golden age of distressed. I mean, the spreads went from like, you know, 10% to 50, 70%. Uh, and then that kind of cleared up after 2010, 2011. Uh, we went, started looking at uh, crypto, uh, healthcare, uh, single family homes. So we were big into crypto in 2014, uh, group invested heavily in Pantera probably had about 100 investors in Pantera at one point in time and have had you know more than 100 in that in that fund uh, healthcare uh, you know etc uh, right now you know we're, we're we continue to look because of the times that we're in at distressed uh, and we've seen a lot of great examples of distress the capacity is kind of small uh, like for example there's been like a, a Chinese rush of private investors Chinese and Russian investors have rushed to sell their uh, stakes in uh, U.S. and Western uh, venture capital and private equity deals. Uh, so you're seeing spreads that are going. So it's a 50% spread on top of the discounted price uh, or, the, or the repricing. So it's like a 75% discount from last year or two years ago that you're seeing people getting out. But the volume isn't large enough. And what's happened in secondaries is that when we were looking at secondaries in 2009, there was five funds that were more than a billion dollars. Today, there's probably 20 or 30 funds and all the big players have a secondaries approach. So that all gets caught up in the network of who's buying who's secondaries, et cetera. So it's hard for family offices to penetrate that without paying two and 20 fees, right? Um, but what we, what we still do like is we love unencumbered secondaries where there's distressed owners, people who may own, uh, uh, real estate, for example, and, uh, you know, for some reason, somebody's got to sell because they're old, they want to retire, they're getting divorced, they have illness, whatever. Uh, so real estate businesses, we still think, you know, we were anticipating in 2015 that there was going to be a mad rush for retirement and uh, from baby boomers. We still think that's happening and that a lot of people are going to be selling their businesses and there's going to be real estate attached to those businesses. We had a great example probably in 2010. There was a guy who had started like a five and dime uh, import export business in uh, Brooklyn. And, uh, you know, he was like, uh, you know, first he imported from Japan back in the 60s. Japan pricing got too high. He started importing from China. Uh, and but, he, you know, he made enough money to put his kids through like, uh, you know, Harvard Law School and Yale Med School. Uh, they had no interest in his business. So here he was 75 years old, let him get rid of it. Uh, the business itself was not great, not a great revenue producer, but he owned two blocks of Brooklyn real estate, right? 
And somebody came in and said, look, you know, the real estate value itself is phenomenal. You know, we want to acquire it. So, so you know, we see those kind of deals happening, uh, you know, from time to time. And it's something that's highly desirable to our group. So, so I wanted to uh, thank Pulse and LA for hosting us and uh, Peter Thorlo is right next to me. So Peter, why don't you introduce yourself, talk about Pulse and LA, the services that you offer and, and you know, what, what your firm offers and also about the firm's uh, footprint. Sure. Uh, thank you very much, Marty. Uh, thank you all for attending in person. And those are on Zoom. It's a uh, cloudy day, a little bit rainy in New York City, but it's nice to have everyone here. This is the third uh, event that I'm hosting uh, for Marty, and, and we've known each other for several years now. Uh, the story I tell is I was at a big law firm uh, many, six years ago, I was at a firm called Jones Day. For those of you in the legal business, you know they're international. We were buying companies. We were representing the top 50 to 100 companies in the world uh, and, and others, and we were buying companies. When I turned 50, which was six years ago, I joined Postinelli, and we still represent plenty of companies and, and do lots of work, but probably outside general counsel or IP counsel to 20 or 30 companies, uh, all of the startups uh, mostly, which need capital. So I get to work with people like Cassie and, and others uh, that have uh, Cassie and I are working with Dr. Venuti, he's an orthopedic surgeon, to get funding from one of his many entities. So I try to bring uh, the uh, companies together with the founders, uh, with, with the uh, uh, venture capital, with private equity and the family offices. Postnelli overall, we're based in Kansas City, so you may not know too much about us, but we're 950 attorneys, we're growing strong, big healthcare practice, we're general practice. So a typical client that I bring in uh, will be a client interest in protecting their IP. Then I'll bring in the corporate team. We'll set up a C-Corp in Delaware, operating agreements and all that work. And then as money comes in from family offices or so on, uh, we, we, we bring in the venture capital team to handle the convertible debt, the equity agreements, uh, safe agreements, whatever there is. And then we manage, manage the whole deal, try to introduce them to strategics. So we're opening, uh, the firm is growing nicely. We're opening up, up our 22nd office and Salt Lake City. Um, and, uh, you know, what I like about this is my expertise is on patents and intellectual property. You may have seen that Moderna recently sued Pfizer. There's going to be a lot of that uh, litigation, multi billion dollar litigation on mRNA technology. You may have read uh, Walter Isaacson's book about Jennifer, Dr., uh, Dr. Jennifer Doudner on the CRISPR technology. So there's lots of money in intellectual property. It's been valued at $5 trillion. Lately, what we're doing in some of the capital deals is actually doing debt, equ uh, debt equity IP financing uh, agreements where the, uh, the IP acts as a security interest. So I uh, look forward to spending the next day or so uh, with all of you, getting to hear what you're focused on and always enjoy spending time with uh, Marty to see the big picture of things. So right. thank you very much for coming. And, and thanks, Peter. It's really great to have you. Uh, you know, what, one of the things that Peter doesn't mention is that he's a very young 50-ish and that he <laughs> plays basketball every Sunday morning with a bunch of guys down yeah. at, the, at the gym, right? So and twice during a week. So. Yeah, so he's, a, he, he's a hoopster. And anybody who plays hoops, though, that, that's really dangerous yeah. after 40 years old. But he's still doing it, so God yeah. bless him. Um, and, and, and by the way, we've been working with Pulse and Alley since around 2015. We hosted our first event in Dallas there. Pulse and Alley has a fantastic uh, footprint in the... Uh, South and uh, Southwest with uh, you know Dallas, Oklahoma, uh, et cetera. And uh, they've got, uh, if you're ever in Dallas, you should visit their offices. They're really great. We've also done events with them in Miami, uh, which they have very, I understand they have very nice new offices yeah, there, yeah. right? Somebody told me that Brickle, recently. Brickle area. Um, Brickle Avenue, right? The, the other ones were pretty good anyway. They look right on the bay. Um, so um, you know, we look forward to continue working with them. So, uh, so I was talking about, you know, unencumbered secondaries, um, you know, I also wanted to talk about uh, the day's events coming up, but uh, let's talk about what we're doing in the future. We're going to be in San Francisco, October 4th and 5th. We'll be at Morrison Forster. We're going to be at Coleman in Dallas, October 25th. Fiduciary Trust in Miami for Art Basel, November 28th and 29th. We'll be back in New York City in Midtown on December 13th and 14th. And then we're going to be in San Francisco again on January 11th and 12th. I'm not sure with who, maybe with Eisner. Um, so a fantastic day, you know, uh, we're going to have a, a, some fantastic uh, speakers talking about uh, the economic outlook, macroeconomics. Uh, we have Pablo Calvarini from Graham Capital uh, talking about the, the macro environment and the many macro funds that they manage. Uh, at the end of the day, uh, we have some fantastic uh, real estate 
um, uh, speakers as well. And, uh, and then we're talking about, you know, managed reflection and what I call like alternative alternatives where, you know, uh, funds that create, that generate alpha, no matter what circumstance they're in, which to me, uh, you know, in this day and age really matters a lot. Um, and historically there was always an era, maybe in the 1990s where, you know, when hedge funds spoke, they talked about alpha, they didn't talk about leverage beta. And that's a big deal to this group because, you know, you want your money to work in whatever circumstance you're in. Uh, so I think that's a big deal. Yep. I'm sorry, Peter, another. Yeah, one of the things you'll see in the agenda that uh, worked with Marty on and really excited about, um, I was in the military uh, years ago. I went to a military academy. I, was, I never was in active duty or anything like that. I was just in reserves for 10 years. We've been, uh, I've been working with DARPA over the years for some, uh, you know, all different capital flows, projects they're working on, amazing technology. So I think we're really excited. They're going to be coming up uh, today, maybe be here later after, uh, tomorrow afternoon. But they'll be speaking tomorrow morning about some of the initiatives that they're doing. Uh, as you can appreciate, the government has done uh, a lot more things, the chip technology in Ohio, trying to bring more things back to the United States, trying to get the United States to, to invest in uh, critical areas. All of you around the, the room and on Zoom know about national security interests, whether it's, it's China and Taiwan or Ukraine or, or always conflicts in the Middle East. So we're really excited to have them speak tomorrow and uh, you know, hope you, hope you uh, get a chance to listen to them. And if you're in security or cybersecurity, you, know, it, 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 you, you probably want to be speaking to, you know, DARPA. Another one that we have had speaking in the past is Incutel, which is a CIA uh, a venture fund, which and now it's a venture private equity fund, which I think has grown from around, you know, 500 million 20 years ago to like 15 billion plus today. Uh, and they have a significant presence in, in Silicon Valley uh, investing. Um, and, and also the U.S. Army has a military agency uh, now that's just oriented towards uh, cybersecurity as well. And there's a woman who has spoken at our events in uh, Dallas, or Austin, Texas, uh, about the issues as well. So, so, you know, we've been talking about macroeconomics for a while here. And, um, you know, some people have had some dire predictions. We had the, the ex, uh, you know, Stanford um, endowment uh, CIOs uh, who manages today now, you know, several billion dollars in multifamily office uh, speak in San Francisco back in June. And we've had other people speak as well. And, you know, when people say things are going to be dire, I don't think everything's going to be as dire as they were in the 1930s, where people who were working at steel plants were dying every week, falling into smelters. So, and you know, the reality is that, you know, there was an era of, of building trains and railroad tracks, et cetera. So, so although I accept there to be disruption, uh, you know, when people say depression, I'm, I don't think there's any such thing as a depression that's going to be like the 1930s because, you know, the reality is we have fantastic logistics in this country. Everybody's connected on the internet and people can get access to information and services very quickly if they need to. Uh, so, so I'm only saying that because we have Michael Belkin speaking from the Belkin Report. He, he might be talking about depression here. So Michael, <laughs> so why don't, why don't you introduce yourself Tell us what you do before you get into your presentation and tell us about the services that you sell. You have a newsletter, I assume, you do research for financial firms. Talk about that for a couple of minutes and then we'll get into your presentation. 